Just like with the Manchurian crisis in the last lesson, what we're going to do in this lesson is talk about another major international crisis that took place, this one being the Abyssinian crisis or the Italian invasion of Abyssinia. So we've been examining in the last few lessons a couple of international disasters, essentially, that have been increasing the pressure on the League of Nations into the early 1930s. We talked about the Great Depression, and then we also talked about the Manchurian Crisis, the Japanese invasion of Manchuria and subsequent invasion of the rest of China in 1936. Um, uh, well, the Manchurian Crisis was earlier on in 1933, 1932, 1933. The, Manchur uh, the invasion of China was 1936. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the Abyssinian crisis, which is the invasion of Abyssinia uh, by the fascist nation of Italy. And this will also show, will also show in this lesson why this also contributed to the collapse of the League of Nations. If you're in the exam and you get asked a question that talks about an examination of the reasons for the collapse of the League of Nations, you can't really answer that kind of question without making reference to both uh, Manchuria and the Abyssinian crisis as well as the Great Depression as well. So one of the countries that we've been talking about in reference but not really spent much time focusing on is Italy in this period. Now Italy was a very very important um, country uh, when it came to international relations into the uh, 1930s going up to the Second World War. Between 1922 and 1925, um, the country of Italy was fraught with uh, the growing of a fascist dictatorship. We start to see the development and, uh, and the entrenchment of fascism within uh, the Italian state in these early 1920s. In 1922, Benito Mussolini, who was the fascist leader, had been made prime minister after threatening to march on Rome if he was not given power. So we see this sort of period of liberal Italy um, just descend into a fascist state. Now, once in power, uh, Mussolini managed to revert uh, Italian democracy, essentially changing the rules relating to voting and turned fascist Italy into a fascist dictatorship. And the fascist party um, took a majority in the 1924 elections. By 1925, the establishment of the fascist dictatorship in Italy had taken place, essentially. And we have, uh, at this point, the first fascist um, country, uh, potentially in history, uh, existing in 1925 in Italy. Now, under this new fascist regime that Italy um, began... They started to make efforts when it came to international conflicts. They wanted to um, start international conflicts essentially with uh, Abyssinia, modern-day Ethiopia. Now, there are a few reasons why we wanted um, to see, uh, or at least the, the uh, Italy wanted to see the invasion of Abyssinia, and they wanted to take that uh, territory. And a lot of these reasons, you might be wondering why Italy wanted to take this particularly um, uh, you know, uh, a particularly uh, relatively unheard of period of uh, area of, of geography, um, why they actually wanted to take this particular land. Well, there are a number of reasons why Mussolini sought to invade Abyssinia. Firstly, there was an Italian defeat in 1896. The Italians were defeated, and it was seen that the fascist party wanted revenge. A lot of this, a lot of the kind of things that we relate to when it comes to um, the the Nazi party in Germany and the fascist party in Italy, they tended to um, seek and put a lot of their ideology into the framework of revenge for past defeats. With Germany, it was revenge against France in World War One. In, with Italy, we have uh, a number of instances, one of them being uh, Italian defeat in 1896. Another reason why was because Mussolini sought to revitalise the glory of Italy, making um, it a great empire again. Italy had already controlled areas surrounding Abyssinia, namely Italian Somaliland, and what is interesting is uh, when it came to the sort of colonial expansion of a number of different empires around Europe, um, Italy wanted a very similar kind of thing. They wanted to revitalize the glory of the Roman Empire in the similar kind of way as, as existed thousand years before. Now, Finally, a successful invasion of Italy would also boost Mussolini's popularity and it would also distract people from, of course, the growing crisis in the global economy since the 1929 Wall Street crash. Nothing, um, nothing quite distracts somebody from a crisis like an invasion of another country, especially if that invasion is successful when it came to Abyssinia. So 
what we have is a number of different factors that have led to the idea of, the ideas by Mussolini to invade Abyssinia, which is modern day Ethiopia. Now, we're going to talk about the um, events that took place in terms of the invasion of Abyssinia itself. And then we will talk again, just like we did in the last lesson, about the League of Nations response to the invasion of Abyssinia. A little bit more staunch than the one against uh, Japan in the Manchurian crisis. But then we'll talk again about why these uh, particular responses still ultimately failed as well. So... In October 1935, the invasion of Abyssinia begins. The Italian forces cross the borders into the country with heavy artillery as well as heavy armour. And immediately what happened was the, the government of Abyssinia appealed to the League of Nations for help in this particular matter. And then rather than doing very little, as was with the case of Manchuria, the League of Nations actually tried to do something about the fact that Italy had just invaded another country. They began to impose economic sanctions on Italy for violating international law, or at least violating the law of the League of Nations. So we start to see um, some, kind of, um, some kind of response from the international community, from the League of Nations, as a result of the attack on Abyssinia. But there are a number of reasons why these economic sanctions weren't that effective. The only pr the problem with economic sanctions is they have to be effective. And another issue that relates to economic sanctions is they have to be almost universal, especially when you've got countries trading with lots of other countries around the world. They all have to be imposing economic sanctions. So while the League imposed economic sanctions, they did not impose a ban on oil exports to Italy because they feared that the United States would not support an effort in that particular regard. So the economic sanctions and the, uh, and the trade embargoes that could have existed in terms of oil exports to Italy could have done a lot more damage to the Italian economy and potentially have stemmed the tide of the conflict uh, and the tide of the invasion. But they feared that the United States would not support an effort of that particular regard. Now, this is obviously very problematic, considering that the United States is not a member of the League of Nations and never has been. And we noted in an earlier lesson that the fact that the United States is not a, a member of the League of Nations is a problem for the League of Nations. The fact that the, the most um, powerful country in the world um, is not a member of your international group means that they significantly are weakened by that particular uh, fact. There's also the reason that because there were, even though there were economic sanctions, the Suez Canal was still open to Italian vessels. So the Suez Canal that exists um, across in Egypt that basically allows trading routes from the Mediterranean into um, it, through to the Middle East, through the Middle East and then across into Asia. This was a very important economic hub. It still is a very important economic hub. And it was still open to Italian vessels because um, of France and Great Britain. They refused to close the canal to the Italians. Again, this is an example of individual states like the United States, France and Great Britain acting in their own economic interests rather than acting in the interests of the international community. Now, there's not, that's not necessarily to suggest that that is incorrect or wrong, but what it does is, is it hampers any kind of sanction that can be placed on Italy because it means that Italy can still trade freely through the Suez Canal as a result of uh, France and Great Britain, who owned the canal, by the way. And the US would not have supported or uh, a banning of oil exports, which meant that Italy could still re re take, get oil from other countries as well. So it just essentially meant that the economic sanctions were very ineffective. And within less than a year, Italy had taken all of the Abyssinian territory by May 1936. So we can see that these economic sanctions were not very effective because they were still able to take the entire of the Abyssinian territory. And other than that, other than these economic sanctions that were placed, the League of Nations did very little. And again, this is another example of a significant weakening of the League of Nations. Now, in the next lesson, what we're going to do is talk a little bit more about uh, the beginnings of the collapse of the League of Nations and, and what ultimately leads to the reasons why the League of Nations collapses. And then we'll, from then we'll move on to talk about um, Germany in a lot more detail. We'll talk about the German expansion across Europe. We'll talk about the policy of appeasement and then eventually bring ourselves to talking about the 1939 invasion of Poland and the start of the Second World War.